Oh, sorry. <laughs> echo, 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 echo. All right. Uh, I apologize first for a bit of confusion with the topic. You know, it's I sort of wrote it like I write I, at play, which is a sort of discursion that I later sort of hone in on some kind of topic. Um, uh, so that's pretty much, in fact, um, for one thing, how many of you know about at play or have ever seen it or read it? Okay, a few people, uh, more than I expected. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. In any case, you can go ahead and put the slides up now. The Infinite Dungeon. Ooh. Purposes and drawbacks of and new uses for randomness in roguelike games, gaming with about five major asides to random topics that are mostly actually related to the main topic. So. All right, so any case, so that, so let's move on. First question, who the hell am I? Uh, let's see, uh, I wrote a roguelike column for the website Game Set Watch for about six or seven years back, back when Game Set Watch was updating. If I don't know if any of you know of that website. Uh, yeah, Game Set Watch was my favorite gaming website on the internet and I jumped at the chance to write a column for it, and it lasted for some time. Um, let's see. Beyond that, I'm a multi ascender at NetHack. I can talk your ear off about 50 or 60 different computer games and subcultures and such. But beyond all those things, I feel it's important to drive this home. I am just a guy. Uh, I do not claim to be an expert on roguelike design. Uh, I've, I've played around with some of the game I, uh, uh, concepts. I've played a ton of games, especially back when I was writing the column, and I'm still writing the column now, it's just a lot slower now, and not on games that watch. Um, uh, but other than, I mean, this is the world as I see it, and I'm not trying to, yeah, it's, no, well, this is kind of, so anyway. So as I say, I don't present anything that I tell you as indisputable facts. I can only write about how things seem to me, my perspective. All right, so let's move on. Um, well, uh, to begin with, one of the reasons why the column slowed down, while it's still kind of slow now, is, and please don't boo or hiss about this, is that I've sort of started to get dissatisfied with some aspects of roguelike play roguelike games, right? Um, which is part of it is, uh, I feel like, I felt like I was exhausting the topic. I wrote about 77 columns on this. And I actually, most of them collected into a book, actually. Available on newsstands now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I spent, I remember when the rogue guys were up here, I talked about rogamatic. I wrote a whole column on rogamatic. Yeah, and because of bit rot, how web pages tend to disappear from the internet if someone isn't curating them and just keep paying the server bills. I don't even know if any other information on Rogomatic still exists on the internet. Um, so I'm kind of proud to preserve something about that. In any case, about the time that I was starting to to, 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 to satisfied. Um, that's about the time actually when roguelike started to hit the public eye, the weird uh, conjunction of occurrences there. Sometimes I say, as it says here, that half the things on Steam call themselves roguelikes, um, including a number of things where I think the, the connection is kind of tenuous. Anyway, so about that. I, I started thinking about it, and one of the things I considered was the hipster's urge, like, oh, it's popular now, I'm not interested in that. Um, I don't think that's it, though, because I still really, really love Rogue, and I still pretty much love NetHack, and I think the reason I'm kind of falling away from NetHack recently is because, although it had this fearsome reputation as a player killer of a game of infinite depth, it's not, it's still finite. And after you've read through the NetHack wiki about 20 times, like I have, yeah, you, you, you do eventually learn everything that's in the game. Um, you believe it or not, it can happen to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I played Crawl a bit. Um, and there are some of the newer games I do like, and I'm trying to focus more on those these days. Like Spelunky. I think Spelunky is godlike. Spelunky is one of my favorite games of all time. If you haven't played it, you should go and play that. 
as soon as possible. Uh, let's see, uh, Hyper Rogue, which is a, a much simpler game, but still got sort of interesting ideas to it. Uh, Brogue, how many of you have played Brogue? Oh, <laughs> Brogue is great, and he's made some wonderful design choices that I greatly respect, like taking out experience points. Uh, just making, just tying player, player uh, advancement entirely to your equipment. Um, oh, also another game, uh, and in fact, this is sort of an aside, so I devote a whole slide to it. This, Strange Adventures in Infinite Space. This is another of my favorite games of all time. If you got, uh, this, it's a, it's a, it's a, the guy, people who made it didn't call it a sort of a roguelike at first, but then the buzzword thing hit. So now they refer to it as that. But really, it's, it's like a coffee break roguelike. It's a full game beginning to end. It's about 20 minutes if you don't die. Uh, I'm sorry for saying uh a lot. Yes, see. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, the people who make it digital eel. They've made a couple of sequels. And this is, this is uh, if, if you come away with nothing else, try to look up this game. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so moving on. Yeah. But a lot of the new games had great people getting interested in, particularly, and this is not meant as an offense to people who made the game, especially if you're in the audience here. Uh, Dungeons of Dreadmore, for example. I played a great deal of Dungeons of Dreadmore before I realized that it's, it's mostly kind of a grind. Yeah, and Rogue Legacy, uh, to me, is a game that's about grinding. Actually, The Binding of Isaac, I haven't really played that much of, uh, but there are things about that lead me to believe that it wouldn't be too interesting to me. Uh, Let's uh, see, um, that, that's one thing that I, I just take a moment, I speak up against, grind. Any of you who are aspiring game developers and designers, from the bottom of my heart, if you come away with no other information here, try to avoid grind. Okay, and uh, the Stone Soup guys, the Dungeon Crawl guys, have gone to great lengths to eliminate grind from their game. Uh, that grind is just sort of bake work play. That's when you're just bapping away at monsters like World of Warcraft just to gain experience points to get to the next level. It's, it's spacer, it's filler. It's not, there are no interesting gameplay decisions there. It's just increasing numbers mindlessly. And grind is very popular in game design circles right now. Things like half the free-to-play games that you find are about grind. Most things that call themselves role-playing game are like 90% grind. Please do everything you can to eliminate grind. The human race will thank you. Um, any case, so there are these games, and a lot of these games are out there, and I had the choice of the rights about them or not. And the thing is, I, and that says right here, I have a strong opinion about you can't fake enthusiasm. If you don't like the thing you're writing about, but you have to pretend to like it, I've never mastered that trick. I can't do it. Uh, and I've read countless articles by people who are very obviously doing it, and I have no idea how they live with themselves. And which is not to say anything about these games, these games up here are bad. They just don't appeal to me personally, and I don't think I can, I can do them justice if they don't. Anyway, so I started thinking about why they don't appeal to me, so we'll move on. What well, the games lack is a complicated question. There's many things, but there's something about that has been on my mind a long time. And uh, this is something I've struggled to put into words for years, and I've tried to write an app play column about them and failed for months. It's one of the reasons why the column is sort of on break right now. I've been trying to do this. But this is sort of my attempt to get it off my chest. So we're moving on. Before that, it has to do with the nature of a random dungeon. You know, a thing that you, you uh, it's a space that, you know, uh, your character explores. It's supposed to be like full of deadly peril. Um, it's worth going back to the origins of the idea. This is before, I actually asked the rogue people if they knew about this before and they told me no. So why do I know? Uh, <laughs> uh, the first uh, recorded instance I think I could find about random dungeon gameplay was actually in, back in TSR's days of owning Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, back long before Wizard of the Coast, uh, they published a magazine called The Strategic Review, and the first issue, Gary Gygax himself wrote an article about creating random dungeons just with die rolls. Um, and, and the first edition of the Advantage of the Dragons DM Guide 
uh, you expand it into an appendix, which is laughably complete. It tells roll dice, how long this corridor will be, how many branches there'll be. And the whole appendix is kind of silly because none of it means anything. It doesn't create a dungeon. It's just a layout of rooms. And I've played a number of roguelike games that feel sort of like that. Uh, it, there's no, there's no like, chat, like, let's, let's look at, oh, this is, yeah. Oh, uh, let's look up, actually, well, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm kind of meandering through here. Uh, how to put it this way? Uh, let's say you had, uh, 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 you had a game in front of you, and it had a grid of rooms, you know, and it was, uh, trying to, trying to, to put this in words. Let's say, uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, uh, I, I'm a little nervous. Uh, let's say that you explore and there's, of course, monsters and items in this, but the monsters aren't challenging and the items are interesting. So why, in this case, do you have a random dungeon? If, if, the, if the contents of the dungeon are interesting, the dungeon is meaningless. It's, it's just grind, as I told you before. <laughs> It's just a way to get your numbers up to be ready for the next dungeon, which hopefully will be harder, but pr probably won't be. Um, if, if, if there isn't things that challenge you along these corridors, there's no reason to go by down one corridor rather than another one. It's just the space. It, 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 you, you might as well have just created uh, a non-random dungeon. Oh, uh, it's... Anyway, and sort of like to illustrate this, there exists this flash game on the internet that took the Appendix A of Dungeons and Dragons and automated it into a flash game. And it creates a dungeon for you exactly like Gary Gygax's system would, but it's just basically a gambling simulation. Do you keep exploring and maybe die, or do you retire and bank your funds and then play again? And it's that, that thing, though, about sort of uh, dungeon about roguelike games having an essential gambling aspect. When I noticed that, and I noticed this sort of a dis was a disquieting thought for me, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. Anyways, so where was I? Okay, uh, one of the things that this early edition of Solo DD is its arbitrariness. Nothing logic connects to anything else. Uh, the process of mapping can be discarded. Even though the, uh, there are choices given for movement, it doesn't matter which one you pick because they, they all lead to the same function, the same die rolling. Um, the dungeon uh, is ultimately just a linear series of challenges with the occasional opportunities for escape mixed in. Uh, oh, this is another thing. Um, uh, w w some people were inspired by the uh, the, the, that appendix and made their own game based on it. This is one of them. I discovered this a few years ago. I don't know if any of you ever f heard of the Play-Doh system. Oh, it, it does my heart good to see even just two or three hands. Yeah, so uh, this, it, it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly obscure these days. But it, yeah, these are basically the first computerized versions of Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, the first, one of the first uh, computer games at all, other than I think arcades. They are in these amber screen monitors, and they made several Dungeons and Dragons style games for them. You can experience them themsel yourself at a website. It's uh, there, cyberone.org. You can't just go there and play them, though. You have to, to apply for an account there. Uh, but yeah, I wrote about it in Link back in 2008 on Games That Watch, and there's the link right there. If any of you wants a copy of this presentation afterward, I'll be happy to give you a copy, and you can get all these things. You don't have to take notes. I'll probably put up my website soon. Anyway, moving on, moving on, moving on. So gambling. I compare these games to gambling. What do I mean? Well, you progress through a series of encounters, the contents of which you have very limited control, and you have to try your luck against them. Yeah. Um, Let's see, and, uh, the game D&D &D that I pointed out like that is particularly like that. You, uh, and you're a first level character in this game. You're going to die 50% of the time if you encounter a monster. Uh, if you win or lose, it doesn't really matter, because the next monster, you also have a 50% chance of winning. Uh, so you'll eventually die until you luck into a magic item, which basically effectively boost your levels by several points just by itself. And it's just basically, it's basically uh, role-playing by die rolling. And uh, let's see, um, there is a point to this. I'm just trying to remember what it was. 
Anyway, so the only real choice in the game is do you stay on the current level and you hope to find another magic item to increase your strength more, or do you dive? And uh, that's, that's really all the game ultimately that's there. Uh, and if you make the wrong decision, you die and you start over from scratch. This is permadeath, uh, I think it's actually before Rogue. Uh, and you're back at level one weekly and you have to find another magic item before you can, you can really play again. Oh, and Rogue came along. And Rogue expanded the dungeon model tremendously. It was no longer like a sequence of spaces, each of which might include an encounter, but the spaces mattered because the monsters could use them too. And uh, the tactics of the game, you know, expanded the, uh, expanded the tactics of the simulation tremendously, uh, and you could encounter multiple monsters at once. And it made the dungeon more of a place that, uh, you know, the dungeon itself provided your opportunities. Uh, you know, doorways are safe spots to attack from. Rooms that are dark, you, you can be attacked in multiple directions just at any moment. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, anyway, so I considered that, uh, uh, since the place, yeah. Yeah, that's just what I said, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, so, anyway, so I started thinking about these random dungeons and what their lacks were, and so I went to the ultimate source of all this, which would be Dungeons & Dragons Adventures. Uh, and this is of the cover of the Village of Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> which is the beginning of one of the archetypal Dun uh, Dungeon and Dragon Adventures of all time. That would be the Temple of Elemental Evil. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever played this adventure. I had a chance to run it for some friends a few years ago. And this is the most amazing thing. It's like even the town at the beginning, if you read through it, there are subplots upon subplots. These merchants are actually secretly evil people who are watching what the adventurers are doing. And if they come back with a lot of money, they're going to try to shank them. These is other guys, they're just honest innkeepers. Um, the, the temple itself, uh, uh, if you've ever read the adventure, there's stuff buried in the walls of this dungeon. There's a big sand pit on the first level. If the player should happen to dig 60 feet down, there's a gigantic pile of treasure down there. <laughs> my players started digging in that room and they got so excited. Oh my god, they're going to find the horde. There's a plus five sword down there and they're like level three. But then they stopped. <laughs> and I just wanted to tell them, keep digging! Uh, and the things like that, though, that's, you know, I speak with such enthusiasm about all the in ingenuity that went into the dungeon. It's one of Gary Gygax's best. Uh, I think it's Gary Gygax and Frank Mincer who wrote it, actually. Uh, but that's the type of excitement and the sort of thing that I find that roguelikes don't have so much, you know. It's, it, and I started thinking, and I thought about it, what it is, is that what, the, what, what those old school D&D &D games had, ultimately, was a backstory. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just exploring the dungeon, or it's, there was a reason for everything. The monsters in that room, they have a social structure. Yeah, they moved in about 20 years ago. They found out the pickings in the area were good. They make a living waylaying travelers. Uh, they get rid of their, their trash dump is this room. This room is where they have the nursery and they raise new goblins. <laughs> And this connection, this, this sort of backstory, how it all get together, not only does it make the dungeon seem a lot more like a real place, but also can be taken advantage of by the player. That's not just window dressing. If, say, the players find the goblin's secret, uh, uh, their prison, they can release the prisoners and perhaps gain allies. If they find the trash dump, they might search through it and find the worthless gold pieces that they throw away because goblins, these goblins at least, have have no uh, wealth incentive. Um, and that's, that's one of the things I really like about Dwarf Fortress, because it's sort of like approaching the problem from that direction, where it, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dwarf Fortress, is, uh, uh, the, 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 the reason for its creation is basically Tarn's brother writes these stories, and Tarn Adams tries to create a game in which the stories are possible, where they could happen. 
And I, I really like that idea. And I think ultimately, in the direction that roguelike games will be will be going in the future, we'll be going to see more about that sort of like behind the scenes, algorithmically generated stories that explain the dungeon, and that a canny player can take advantage of. Like he might have develop some intuition. I'm beginning to more about intuition in a minute because it's really the focus of what I'm getting to. Uh, if you find uh, the explanation sort of reasons the things are in the dungeon, it's anyway. Let me let me move on here. Uh, about yeah, I just I think I just actually skipped over several slides. I just explained them to you directly. Uh, it's great. Yeah, there's Zuckmoy. Zuckmoy, by the way, is the evil demon who runs the Temple of Elemental Evil. Yeah, uh, it's just fun to say Zuckmoy. Zuckmoy. Uh, let's see, there's the, the, yeah, let's see. So anyway, there's the random, yeah, this is just what I talked about. Whoever wrote this was a genius. Um, yeah, patterns, uh, yeah, let's go about that. Okay, this is the slide that's kept me up for months. Knowledge, logic, and wit. I have thought about this for years. Okay, trying to sort of codify the, the, the types of game playing skill. And this is what I've come up with. Knowledge, logic, and wit. Okay. Knowledge is stuff that you consciously know. You know, uh, there's stuff on the next page about that, actually. Knowledge. The thing the player consciously knows about a game. Cockatrices may turn you to stone. Interesting fact, that. How to identify wand? You know in NetHack, if you write with a wand in the ground, the effects can tell you what the wand does? But some of the effects are inconclusive and left to us already text there. So you always write with your finger first and then write with the wand second because you'll get more information that way. That's knowledge. That's something about the game that you, you've learned or got from a fact. That's the, that's the, import, that's the definition. Knowledge is things you can read in a fact. And uh, I thought for a long time about what kinds of information don't go into effect. What, what ways can you write a game that's fact-proof? I ultimately came up with the conclusion that ultimately nothing. Uh, but you can, you can delay it. A random game is ultimately a, a response to facts, or at least a way to get around just players telling each other how to play, how to do while a walk through to NetHack is not the same thing as a walk through to the Elder Scrolls or anything like that because there's so much variance along the way. Uh, but there are still facts for NetHack. They're more, instead of like exactly what to do, it's what all the possible items are. Well, what if you had a roguelike game that could make up its own items? Well, then people would write a fact about the limits of the range of possibilities. And it goes on and on, it's a fool's errand, there's no end to that trail. So people will always find information to tell each other about a game. Anyway, that's knowledge. A second thing is logic, which is thinking about the knowledge that you have and using it to deduce things about the game state. It's sort of like if you encounter a puzzle in a game you've never seen before, but the puzzle obeys certain rules. The rules are knowledge. Applying the rules is logic. And then we have wit, which is the thing I'm most uh, thinking about and the thing I'm most iffy about. Wit is sort of natural game playing ability if such a thing exists. Like you ever have a friend who you show him a game the first time and he wins it in the first try? Or you teach someone a board game and they beat you that first time even though they've never played it before? Uh, and that's sort of what I'm talking about, this sort of intuition. And it's, it, in, a, in a sense, it's things you don't know you know which makes me sound a bit like Dick Cheney. I'm f sorry for that. Um, yeah, I know it's not a good name. Uh, let's see, it, it, but it's interesting because it's hard to pin down like that. Uh, let's see, it's just more about probabilities and what will probably work well for you, but also sort of, sort of figuring out uh, uh, this, uh, and the difficulty I'm having telling you this right now just meant with the reason why it took me months and years to actually put this down. Uh, anyway, it's things to do with whim, psychology of the algorithm designer, educated guesses, all of this stuff. The thing about wit, though, is the, the more you think about it, the more it becomes knowledge. Wit turns into knowledge as you realize what's happening. Like, 
Say you're given a choice of rooms, and although you don't know it yet, if you go to the left room 70% of the time, you'll find a lot of treasure. And 30% of the time, you'll find a horrible monster. And the other room mirrors those possibilities. Well, if you play the game enough times, eventually you'll realize that if you make this choice, it will come out the better for you more often. And at first, that'll become a subconscious realization. And when you've noticed it, it'll become a conscious realization. That's how it progresses from just chance to wit to knowledge. And so I set myself the problem of five minutes. Okay. Uh, I'll try to hurry up through here. Um, let's see. It's like uh, traditional games. Uh, yeah. yeah. So just five minutes left. How about we just like, does anyone have any questions about this? Or have we explained it well enough? Okay, I gotta keep going. All right. uh, uh, here's here's an example. I don't know if any of you do crossword puzzles. Uh, if you've d very experienced crossword puzzle uh, solvers, will tell you this, or at least they should. Uh, that you sort of get a sense after a while about what the answers will be. That sort of serves as a sort of kind of internal hint guide. The way crossword puzzles are put together, they're hard to put together because all the words, every letter in a traditional professional Crawford puzzle has to cross twice, vertically and horizontally. Uh, and there are only so many kinds of combination of that that exist. And so like you're never gonna find a crossword puzzle where you're very rarely gonna find one that uses like xylophone as a word. Because the thing about xylophone is the first letter is an X. Which means if you use xylophone, some you're gonna have to have some word in the puzzle that has an X in it. And so that's one of the sort of the little tips to problem but if you find a very rarely used letter, you know that the thing that crosses is going to be in these certain possibilities. And the result is the matrix of probabilities about which words can go into which places. And the more puzzles you do, the more you realize what that is. And it's something that really only experience can teach you. Uh, and cryptograms are another sort of uh, type of puzzle that works like that. Uh, cryptograms are just basically simple substitution ciphers. Uh, uh, to do them, it, it, people looking at one at first, they seem like impossible until you realize that the English language words have shapes that are determined by their length and the uh, occurrence of letters, the frequency. And that shape is also determined by its place in the sentence. And that way you develop a sense of what this word can or can't be. And it's, again, it's, it's something that you can find rules of thumb for, but ultimately only experience can teach you. And that's I think ultimately the direction that these games, I think that's, I think I get something, the, the core of roguelike gaming, it's finding things that are fact with the only experience can teach you. And, uh, and I ultimately think that it's impossible, but it's, it's worth chasing. Anyway, I think I'll just stop it there. Uh, that's, that's not sound good? Yes? You have a question? There's knowledge about the, the rules of the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and how eyes are set up and it, how to form them. Right. And so then, and then there's there's logic. You know, given a given a current board state about how you might proceed. Yeah. But there's also a, a, an intuition that you have to develop because you know, our, our brains aren't aren't able to really track all of the possibility, all possible futures for a game. I wish I had thought of that example, because that's perfect. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I guess you probably got it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a, as a comment slash question. But I wonder if that, well, yeah, let me add one thing, I guess, that um, that it seems to me there's there's a, a valuable thing that is maybe what you're getting at in, in the randomness of a game like a roguelike. Where because it's random, the, the space of possibilities that could be created, if it's artfully done, can create a set of interesting problems that you can develop an intuition for, yeah. but never truly have the, the logic to strictly proceed through. Yeah. Um, but then if that's done poorly, you just have random events that there's no uh, way to develop an intuition and, uh, and an intuitive and skill for. And just gambling. And gambling, I don't really sort of almost consider it, I think almost consider it like not a game. Um, the, 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 the ultimate, the, where all this was leading is I've actually been starting work on a game that I, I hope will demonstrate this sort of principle of intuition and actually prove if I'm onto anything or not. And it's a game we're going to call Casino Dungeon. 
And one of the things about the game is most games that use randomness basically simulate the the logical I mean the the, the random construct they simulate are die rolls, which are discrete events. Each number nothing the number have nothing to do with each other. Well, Casino Dungeon replaces die rolls as with it, of its core logical uh, representation of randomness with decks of playing cards. Like the dungeon layout is actually a grid of 49 playing cards arranged in a grid. And the cards not only determine the kind of encounter you'll have in that space, but they'll also determine the, the, the layout of the dungeon itself. So the dungeon layout is itself a hint for where the good stuff are is and where the things that probably kill you will go. And because there are those hints, I ratchet up the difficulty a bit. So there are pl spaces you don't ever want to go. I just could possibly just kill you outright unless you're prepared for them. And that's in order to give weight to it in order to, to in order to give the player an incentive to develop that intuition. Whether I'm on the right track with it or not, I have no clue. It's, it's, an ex it's a gameplay experiment, but I think ultimately those are the kinds of games that are, that are best to work on. The, game the ones you don't know if they'll work or not while you're working on it. And that's why uh, the seven-day roguelikes are so great, because they're all gameplay experiments, and uh, just bless them, everyone. All right. Hey, thank you it? so much. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs>